If you guys don't know me yet, my name is Ethan. Uh, I'm 19 years old. I'm 5'8". 5'8 on a good day. Uh, yeah. you know, Lies. I'm, I'm a sophomore in college, and yeah, I'll be here to pitch an answer today. Uh, so I still remember that day when Judah asked me back in May to preach, start preaching here, right? And I remember I was actually sitting in the cafe, right, over there, and I was like sitting, we were having, having like a meeting about like, uh, you know, typical agency stuff like events and event planning and all that. And he popped the question at the end of the uh, meeting. And I remember I was sitting in my chair. I was like, is this true of me? Like, you want me to preach? Because what was going through my mind at the moment was not like, oh, I can't do this. Or, oh, like, uh, how am I going to be able to come up with something every single week? I, like, I was like, sorry. <laughs> I was really, really nervous, right? Because I really did not know what to talk about. I didn't know if I was qualified to talk about it, right? So, so I prayed and prayed and prayed about it, like, God, what should I teach? What should I talk about? And I, I found out, I realized that the topic that God wanted me to talk about today was intimacy. Can I want to say intimacy? Intimacy. Intimacy. So you guys talked about the discussion questions earlier, right? Uh, how would you define intimacy? That was one of the questions, right? So, for Google, <laughs> I looked it up on Google, uh, how they define intimacy, and once the slide gets up there, but the definition of intimacy, according to Google, is close familiarity or friendship, or just closeness, whether with somebody, with someone or something, and that could be anything, right? It could be like friends, it could be family, it could be even like um, cherished like things, objects, things that remind you of memories or whatever, right? So, for me, when I think of intimacy, I think of my parents, right? So me, I have two loving parents, thank God, and, you know, they've been, around, they've been with me my whole life, and raised me, and yeah, yeah, yeah right? Uh, when I think of intimacy, I think of them. But, when I was little, when I was growing up, I didn't really have the best relationship with them. Can anybody relate with me? Like, not having like the best relationship with your parents, always like arguing with them, like fighting with them, and just like, like butting heads all the time, right? Me, with me and my parents, our relationship has been like, sort of like a roller coaster. It's with a lot of ups, a lot of downs. And it was really hard for me to have a good relationship with my parents, because we couldn't get along. We always tried to like, argue about things, have different opinions about things. We just couldn't get along. It was really hard to get along. And it was tough, you know? It was, it was really hard to uh, be around them. It was hard to, excuse me. It was just hard to be around them. It was hard to have a relationship with them. It was hard to everything with them. And, you know, like I would tell them, I would talk about it with my friends, like, uh, if I ever had to vent about like family problems or anything, they'd be like, ah, Ethan, it's fine. It's okay. Everything's gonna work out. You're still supposed to love them. You're still supposed to, you'll be fine. Just keep going, even if it's hard. Even if everything goes wrong, just still try to love them and all that, right? And I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you for telling me all that. But like, how? How do you love someone that you keep arguing with? How do you love somebody that you constantly fight with? How do you love somebody that messes up all the time and like disappoints me? And it's always just something to go wrong. How how do I how do I love somebody? How do I love somebody like that? Right? And <clears throat> sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, how are we good? Okay. <laughs> how do I love somebody like that? Right? Uh, I really didn't know for like a really long time. Uh, every single day, I would try my best, but I just really did not know how to do it. I would pray to God about it. I would ask God, like, God, like, what do I do here? Like, I've tried everything. I've tried my best to be a good son. I've tried my best to have good grades, you know, make them happy and all this stuff. But like, it still doesn't work. I still argue with them. I still butt heads with them. 
every single day I have so much stress and so much anxiety to see them, or anger, or frustration, or all these things. God, what am I doing wrong? What's going on? Why can't we get along? Why can't I love them? Why can't they love me? You know, those are all like, these are like these real thoughts I had in my head. You know, and I kept praying about it, praying about it for months on end. And months became years, and you know, as time went on, there, my, my relationship, you know, spoiler, my relationship with my, my parents got better. And I actually want to talk about it. So the, there are three things, through everything that's happened, there are three things that I personally learned about intimacy. So the first thing that I learned about intimacy that's really, really important is constant reminders. Can everyone say constant reminders? Constant reminders. And to illustrate this, I want to talk about a story about this guy named David. Can everyone say David? David. 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 So this David was a guy in the Old Testament, right? In the earlier parts of the book, before Jesus, right? And excuse me. And David, you know, just like a really humble upbringing, like a guy. He was the youngest of twelve siblings. He was kind of looked down upon, you know? He was kind of like, you know, disregarded to the side. He wasn't really, like, uh, important in his, in, like, society, let alone his own family, right? But God chose him, you know, to uh, lead his kingdom. God chose him to do all these amazing things and uh, prepare him for all these things, right? So David, right, usually when people bring up David, like when pastors bring up David or whoever's preaching about David, they always talk about, like, the highs of David. Right? About like how David like beat Goliath, right? Like that huge giant. Uh, how David led the kingdom of Israel to victory, like a lot of like military victories. How David this, how David that, and stuff like that. But I don't think people really talk a lot about how much how often David was in constant turmoil. How much David hurt, how much David suffered, right? So I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple examples, right? In the book of 1 Samuel 17, yet when David was fighting Goliath, right? David, yeah, everyone knows that David beat him, right? But I don't think people really understand how big and how like, huge Goliath was, right? So Goliath, uh, he was about like nine foot ten. That's like three meats, right? Or like for Judah, that's like two and a half Judas. That's, he's tall, he's crazy tall. And he's crazy big too, he was huge, you know? So that caused a lot of stress and anxiety already, right? Uh, a couple books later, in 1 Samuel 18, uh, King Saul, who was like sort of like David's, you can think of it like a mentor or like someone that David looked up to, right? David would come in every single day uh, to play the harp. A harp was like this musical instrument for King Saul to like calm his nerves and stuff like that. But King Saul, uh, over time, he got really jealous of David's accomplishments and how much God favored him over, uh, favored David over him. So King Saul got jealous and started to come after him, tried, tried to kill him multiple times, actually. He would send uh, soldiers to come and get him and hunt him down and all these things, right? So that's another thing. Another thing, after that, a couple books later, in 2 Samuel 16, his own son was trying to kill him, this guy named Absalom. Uh, he, Absalom was, over, over, was able to overtake his father's throne, David, and he also tried to hunt him down after King Saul. So David had so many things happen in his life, so much stress, so much pain, you know? Uh, and he, he writes all of this down in the book of Psalms, right? So I want to, well, after this, yeah, he wrote all of his emotions, everything, in the book of Psalms. Out of 150, I think David actually wrote 73 of them. That's more than half. And those 73 psalms is full of emotions, full of really strong words. Just like, basically like a diary, you know? It's basically uh, David's personal diary. But I think the thing that's really important here is that in the midst of all the stress, all the pain, everything that David went through, David never forgot to remind himself of the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. David never forgot to remind himself. He always tried to remind himself that God is good, God is faithful, God loves him, 
God has great plans for him. I, in fact, I actually want to pull up a verse. So can we pull up uh, Psalm 106, verse 1, please? Psalm 106, verse 1. Psalm 106, verse 1. Nice. So I'll read this to you guys. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. Can you pull up the next verse, actually, too? Uh, Psalms 28, verse 6. Please. Thanks. Praise the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. Amen. So these, these are two verses that I pulled, uh, just showing how much David never forgot to remind himself of how good God was, how much God loves him, how much God, and remind himself that God hears him, and reminding himself that God will do it, that God is faithful, that he will come through on his promises. And I also want to bring up Jesus, too, in the New Testament. So Jesus, even he, uh, after like preaching to like all the crowds about the kingdom of God, after spending the whole day with people like preaching and helping and doing all these things, even he valued his time with God. So... Could you pull up the next verse, please? Mark 1, verse 35, if it's there. That is not the right verse. Hi, okay. So, so I'll just I'll read you guys off my phone. So, in the book of Mark 1, verse 35, uh, it says, Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went out to a secluded place, and was praying there. So, as you can see, right, Jesus, even Jesus valued his morning time with God. And although we have no idea what Jesus would talk about in the morning with God, I imagine, you know, right, he would talk about, um, I bet, I, I imagine he would talk about thanking God in the morning for waking him up. I imagine he'll at, be asking God for strength to get through the day, to uh, be able to help him with all, with everything that's been going on. I'll bet he remind himself why he does this. I bet he remind himself of how good God is, that God's a great plan, even after everything that's happened. And when I think about these verses, and when I think about my parents, right? So I mentioned before that my, I never really had the best relationship with my parents, right? I would argue with them, I would uh, fight with them, yeah, 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 right? One of, the, one of the things I really learned, like, over these past couple of years, when it comes to having intimacy with my parents, having a good relationship with my parents, I realized that I always got mad at them, like I constantly got mad at them because I constantly focused on the things I didn't like about them. Can anyone relate to that? I imagine you guys can, right? Always thinking about how, how you don't like this about your mom or you don't like that about your dad and you think about that all the time, right? And not being able to talk to them about it because I believe that we couldn't have a good conversation, that like tension that I have with my parents that sort of just like, oh, I, I just don't like this about them. <laughs> that, it's like, oh, I just don't like this about them. I found, I realized that that bled into every interaction I had with them, everything we did, you know? And like going out to eat, going to the mall, birthday parties, housewarmings, literally whatever, every time, because I didn't like this thing about them and I couldn't talk about it with them, we would always have some sort of fight or some sort of argument. It would never, always, it would never be peaceful. Always, there's always something, you know. And I learned that in order to start healing my relationship with my parents, God taught me that I have to, I have to learn, be willing to learn to constantly remind myself that my parents love me, that they care for me, and that they also love in different ways, right? Uh, can everyone say love languages? Love languages. Love languages. Right? So you guys know what those are, right? Like, you know how there's like five different types, it's five different types of love, like to give love, to receive love, right? I think it's physical touch, it's words of affirmation, acts of service, gifts, something else. I forgot the last one. But it, it's, oh, quality time. Quality time, that's the last one. Yeah, so I, I start to realize that they love in different ways, right, my mom and dad. And that 
sometimes the way that I receive love and the way they, they give love is different, right? So, for example, me, I'm, I'm very much a quality time kind of person. I love receiving quality time. I like, I like spending like little moments with people all the time, right? But sometimes my mom and dad don't do that and then I'll get mad at them because of that, right? But I start to learn that, oh, you know what? I realize that my mom, yeah, she's like a quality time kind of person, but the way she loves to give love, she's like a physical kind of person. She loves giving hugs, giving kisses, and stuff like that. But I, I don't really like that that much. I get like, ooh, you know, like, I get like an ache almost. Because I just, I just don't like that that much, but my mom does. So, I, start, I had to like teach myself to learn to like, okay, you know what? If she wants to give me a hug, if she wants to like, squeeze my cheeks or like whatever, like let her do that, because that's her way of giving love, you know? It, it, it is what it is. And then my dad, my dad is more of like a, uh, he's more of an action kind of guy, like an acts of service. He, oh yeah, so another love, another way that I like to receive love personally is words of affirmation. Like I'm a big sucker for like compliments and stuff like that, right? Or people tell me they care about me or whatever, I, I like to hear that, right? But my dad doesn't do that. He's not a words of affirmation kind of guy. But what he is, he's an active service kind of guy. He, like, he won't say, I love you, but what he does, what he will do is he'll clean your room. He'll clean your shoes, he'll clean my shoes actually. He'll come to my room and like, just like, tidy up the bed. I, don't, I never like, make my bed in the morning. Cause I'm just like, it's, it's, it's gonna get dirty later anyway, so it doesn't matter. Or messy later. Uh, but yeah, my dad is an active service kind of guy. So, I had to remind myself that my parents grew up in a different culture, a different environment, that that stuff is different. That's why sometimes when we butt heads, I have to remind myself that, oh, you know, it's different for them. They grew up in a different upbringing, different culture, different environment. So I have to be willing to be understanding, you know. Uh, their way of life and minds are going to be different because we grew up in different cultures. But we have to be willing to be willing to understand. That was one of the ways that I like that God's taught me that I have to learn in order to start healing my relationship with my parents. You know, so that's the first thing, right? Constant reminders. Uh, that's the first thing I learned about intimacy. The second thing I learned about intimacy, intimacy, is that it's public and it's private. It's public and it's private. I think Tim Keller, who is like a pastor like this uh, of a church called Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. I think he said it best when he said that private intimacy leads to public power. <clears throat> Investing in a strong relationship with God in your alone time, that's what's going to help lead people to see how good God is through you. So we know, right, that God is a good God. We've gone over this, right? God is a good God. God is a faithful God that he will come through every time, right? Okay, cool. We know that. But... People, other people won't know that unless we can invest in our own personal alone time with God. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Investing in a strong relationship with God in your alone time will not only let other people see how God, how good God is through us, but they'll also, it'll also allow us personally to see how real God is in our day-to-day -day life, the big things and the small things that happen, you know? So many of the great figures in the Bible, right? Like who I was talking about earlier, like David, right? Or like let's say Moses, right? The people that defeated like a nine foot tall giant, or that was able to split the sea in half, right? They invested in their time, alone time with God. That's how they were able to do such big things because they had their own private time with God. They invested in that time in in their relationship with God. And I actually want to uh, bring up an example. So if you put the uh, Daniel versus Chapter 6, verse 10. Great. So I'll read it to you guys. Right? Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, uh, he went into his house, now in his roof chamber. His windows were open toward Jerusalem. He continued to get down on his knees, right? Like, on his knees like this. Well, I'm not going to kneel, but like, you get it. Right? He continued to get down on his knees three times a day. Can everyone say three times a day? Three times a day. Three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. So I'll give you some context for the story, right? So Daniel, right, right before he prayed, he just found out from the king, uh, his name is King Darius, that he just signed a document, like a law. And what the law said was that 
they're not allowed to pray. They're not allowed. They're not allowed to worship God anymore. They have to pray to King Darius actually, like all all day every day for like I think it was like thirty days straight or something like that. And Daniel knew that was wrong. Daniel knew that he shouldn't be praying to anybody else but God or kneeling to anyone but God, right? So this he's doing this in actually actually in an act of defiance against the king, against the king's wishes. You know, and like wow, three times a day getting on your knees to pray. Like, that's like, wow, like, I, I can't do that. I don't do that. I literally, like, if, if I pray, like, well, before I eat, like, I, like before, I know I'm supposed to pray and stuff, but, like, I don't think I speak to that, you know what I mean? Like, I can't even, like, pray to pray before my food, before I eat, let alone pray three times a day, you know? And, yeah, crazy, you know? Uh, but, yeah. In the New Testament, with Jesus, right, he did the same exact thing. Even though Jesus sent the disciples out to, like, pray and minister and bless and inspire all these people and tell them all about the word of God and the kingdom of God and things like that, he also invested in his time with his disciples. He spent quality time with his disciples. Um, I'm actually, actually going to tell you this story in the book of Luke. Uh, in chapter 11, where Jesus was in a place praying, right, and the disciples... He, they came to him asking, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? Can you teach us how to pray properly? And Jesus said, okay, sure. And then he taught them the, uh, you know, the prayer that everybody knows, right? Like, Father, uh, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Like, you know, the typical prayer, right? That's where it comes from. And I'll tell you another verse, I'll tell you another story in Matthew where when Jesus, after he was teaching to the crowds, teaching them like parables, like stories uh, about like weeds, about like farmers, about like, and all of this, after Jesus was done talking to the crowds, the disciples would come to him, ask him to explain what the stories meant, what were they supposed to learn from them, and Jesus said, yeah, sure, and he would explain it to them. The point I'm trying to make here is that Jesus constantly spent quality time with the disciples, you know, teaching them, being with them, encouraging them. But most importantly, being with them, yeah. right? He wanted his relationship with his disciples to be more than what they could offer. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I read, I read this story, and I was like, "Wow, that's literally me with my parents." I always thought of my relationship with my parents not as like, a, "Oh, I love them," but I constantly. I saw that, I constantly saw it as I love them because of what they can give me or what they can offer me, right? I realized that, as I mentioned earlier, right, like, oh, I always felt like my mom and my dad, we always went ahead, they could never, like, fulfill my, like, emotional needs or my mental or spiritual needs or whatever, right? That they would always, like, do it wrong. But not once did I ever think about their needs, you know, not once did I ever think about fulfilling their emotional needs. So I mentioned earlier, right, that my mom, she's a big, she's like a big hugging kind of person, right? She loves giving hugs, giving kisses, and stuff like that. <laughs> she loves receiving it too, right? And all the time, every time she would ask for it, I would always say no because, like, Ew, you know, I, I don't like doing that, right? <laughs> I don't like doing that. But in my journey of trying to heal my relationship with my parents, I, I tr I'm trying to, I try to learn to do that more, right? Like, I'll give you an example, right? Like, my mom, she works at the factory, she would come home, right, at around like four-ish, and that's, that's like after I get home from school. And my mom, she would walk in through the door, right, she was, I would say hi, she would say hi, and then just sit down, like she would watch a movie or something, right? And I would never like give her hugs and kisses before that, because I didn't want to, because I was like, you know, I'm doing my own thing, you know, like. But I tried, one day I decided, you know what, when she comes home, I'm going to try to give her a hug. Just like a, a quick side hug, you know? Nothing, nothing, nothing crazy, you know? No kisses or anything, just, just a simple hug, right? So I, she came home, she walked through the door, she said, hi, Ethan, I'm a hi, ma. Right, she sat down, she turned on her for like her usual K-drama, because she loves K-dramas, right? And I walked up to her, right? And I go, hi, right? I give her like a side hug, and a hi, how was your day, and stuff like that. And then... I'm telling you, her face like lit up, right? She was so happy, because I never do that. But I could tell that I made her day. 
I could tell that even though I didn't want to do it, I was willing to do it. Because I'm, I, I, I made myself do it because I knew that that was, I just met her, I just fulfilled her emotional need, you know, her way of receiving love. Uh, yeah, like I tried doing it more and more nowadays too. And for my dad, thank God my dad's not a physical person, like, he, thank God. I just, I don't like, I'm sorry, I don't. It gives me, it gives me like a, I don't know, I don't know how to do it. But, but yeah, my dad is not like a physical kind of person, right? But, even though, so since he's not a physical person, his way of receiving love, the way he likes to receive love, is quality time. My dad is a big quality time kind of guy. He like, I noticed that he loves to sneak in like those like little moments with me. For example, right, if I'm in my room and I'm like playing whatever, playing like game or like watching a movie or watching YouTube or doing whatever, he would just like he would a lot of times come into my room and just like sit down on my bed, right? He'll sit down on my bed, pull out his phone. And he'll show me, look, Ethan, you want to see this funny video that I, I saw on TikTok? TikTok! <laughs> right? And either that or like, he would pull up like YouTube shorts too, it's crazy. Like, he's, oh, yeah. he's create like, uh, whatever, you know? And I would get annoyed all the time, like, get out of my room, like, I'm trying to like, have my alone time, you know, I'm trying to have my privacy. And eventually he would like, okay, Ethan, and then he'll leave, right? Oh, my God, I'm fine, like, I can have my alone time. But, I realized, God helped me realize that that's the way that my dad likes to show, like, receive love, by having, by being with me. You know, even if we're not doing anything or watching anything, he, he likes being in my, he likes being in my company. Like, he likes having my presence with him. Right? So, I noticed that, and just like my mom, I was, I tried to push myself out of my comfort zone. And then my dad came into my room again, and he shows me like a funny video on TikTok or like reels or YouTube clips or whatever. Instead of just like just brushing it off, I'll be like, oh, that's funny, that's funny. You know, even if I don't think it was funny, I like try, try to make him like try to show that like I acknowledge what you showed me, right? You know, the other thing, <laughs> it's funny because the other thing he likes to show me, if it's not a funny TikTok or like whatever, he likes to tell me like, oh, Ethan, look, there's like a deal on Zara right now. There's like a it's like a promotion on PacSun or something like that. Oh, you can get like $19, it's like $19 for two jeans, Ethan. Oh, oh, oh. And he'll like show me his phone, like put it right in front of my face. And I tried, instead of like not getting, in, instead of getting annoyed at it, I was just like, oh, wow, cool, 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 you know? And I would like take his phone and like pretend to look through it. Even if I'm not looking for anything, I was like, oh, that's really nice, really nice, you know? And same as my mom, right? I noticed that he, every time he came into the room, he started to smile more, right? my dad is not a smiley kind of person, right? He, he's a guy that kind of keeps himself. But I could tell that every time he came into my room, he was excited. And, you know, I changed. And I was like, wow, like, that's like, I'm healing with my, with my parents more at, by doing so, right? Uh, yeah, and relating, relating this with our intimacy, our relationship with God. For mine, I, had, I learned that, like, relating to the first point, I had, to, I had to learn to remind myself that God, as well as well as my parents, want to know me, want to spend time with me, with all of you guys, right? Want to get to understand you, know every problem you have, yeah. or like, he wants to know you, yeah. right? Amen? Amen? He wants to know you, but he's not going to force you to have a relationship with him. Yeah. Does that make sense? He's not going to just like, walk in the front door and be like, be with me. You know, he's not going to do that, right? Like, he's a gentleman. He's going to wait until you decide to go and find him and seek him and spend time with him, reading your Bible, praying, doing all that stuff, right? God wants to know you. Not for what you can do. He wants to know you for you. Yeah. So that's the first two points, right? The first part, the first point, the thing that I learned about intimacy Constant reminders. Constantly remind yourself of how good God is. Constantly remind yourself of how powerful He is, how great He is, all these things, right? Second point, uh, it's public and it's private. If you want, if you want to see God do great things in your life, if you want to have a real relationship with God, invest in it. Yeah. You get what you get out what you put in. That's how I like to think about it, right? 
third one. Can you put the third foot up? Don't give up. It's supposed to be hard because we're both broken people. Both sides are broken people with flaws and with feelings, with troubled pasts. We're people who've been hurting for forever, you know? We're people, you know? We're not perfect. So of course it's going to be hard. Even though it is hard, it's going to be worth it. Amen? Amen. It's worth it. And why should we do it, right? Why should we keep going? Could you pull up the verse, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7? This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, actually. I'll read it to you guys. So, love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful, and it is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked, nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with the truth, when right and truth prevail. This, this is the most important verse. Please remember this verse. Love bears all things, regardless of what comes. Believes all things, looking for the, for the what? What does that word say? Looking for the what? The best. The best in each one. Hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times, endures all things without weakening. If you love somebody, you'll be willing to do whatever it takes to make it work. Amen? Amen. Whatever it takes, how much you have to sacrifice, how much you have to give, how much you have to compromise, whatever it takes, we do that because it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to my parents, the biggest thing that God taught me that I, I still keep thinking about to this day is that no matter what happens, no matter how many arguments we have, no matter how much pain that they cause me, that I cause them, whatever happens, it's worth it. Keep going. Be willing to understand. Be willing to sacrifice. Be willing to give your all into the relationship. Give your best effort. I have to... Uh, God taught me that I had to learn to remind myself that God put them in my life for a reason, right? They, God didn't just like, just like take two random people and say, here, here's your parents. No, right? They, he specifically put my mom and dad in my life as my parents because, not because they're perfect, right? Not because they're like all-knowing or whatever, but because they're perfect for me. Does that make sense? And it's the same for all of you guys. All the people in your life, your friends, your family, especially your parents, right, and your siblings and whoever, they're not perfect people, right? Can we agree on that? Yes. Your, your family are not, is not perfect. I'm sure there's a lot of things to think about, good and bad, when it comes to your family, right? They're not perfect by any standard, but they're perfect for you. Amen? They're perfect for you. God put them in their life to help you grow, and you help them grow as well. You guys grow together, you know? And can I actually uh, call the worship team come back up as I say one last thing? Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. I promise you, because I think back all the time about like how bad things used to be back then with my parents. Like I really could not talk to them. Like it was terrible. Even if things like look great, like when I come to church on Sundays, I'm like, I look like I'm smiling, I'm laughing, I'm doing all these things, right? Like coming to Sunday school or whatever. Inside, I'm hurting. I really am. Like, because I just could not figure out how to have a good relationship with them. But, in my walk with Jesus, I, I just saw, like, the crazy contrast between having intimacy with my parents or my friends or whoever and having intimacy with Jesus. With my parents, with friends, it's... Both sides are, like, flawed. Both sides are hurting. Both sides are imperfect, right? We are bound to disappoint one another. We are bound to hurt each other. We are bound to frustrate each other. It's just gonna happen. It's because we're flawed people. We're broken people. But with Jesus, it's different. It's completely different. Even though we are imperfect and flawed, God, Jesus is not. Amen? Amen. Jesus is perfect. Jesus will never hurt us. Jesus will never frustrate us. Most importantly, Jesus will never leave us. Amen? 
Jesus will not forget us. Jesus will never let us down. He is good. He is a good God. He is a faithful God. And he will come through every single time. Jesus has so much waiting for us. But are we willing to come to him? Right? As I said before, Jesus is a gentleman. Right? He will never force us to have a relationship with him. But there's so much waiting for us. So much good waiting for us. But we have to step into that. We have to lean back into his arms.